Yo, Dylan Leclerc, how are you doing, man? Doing great, Peter. Happy to be here. Nice to see you in Bitcoin colors. Yeah, shout out to my mom, Bitcoin Orange, as she says. Shout out to your mom. Uh, is she uh, or is she Orange Build? Yeah, she's on Bitcoin Twitter too. Is she? Yeah. Oh, I think I, I think I know this. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. I think I know this. What's her account? Uh, Leclerc Kiki. <laughs> Here she is. Yep. It's a picture of a dog. Yeah, she follows me. All right, let's do this. Let's, should we send her a picture? Yeah, I'll get him on. I got it. We got it. We're going to send this out to your mom. Perfect. All right. Hey, dude, brother. Doing great. Living the dream. Austin's beautiful. It's a lot better temperatures and a lot warmer than, than where I'm at in Vermont. So Yeah. And uh, can we talk about how old you are? Are you keeping that secret? No. We can, we can, we can talk about it. So your birthday went two days, Saturday? What day? Uh, exact date TBD, but turning 21 up pretty, Very pretty close. So uh, why are you not in college? Uh, long story, but uh, I dropped out after freshman year. Uh, I think we talked about it in one we of did. the first shows. But uh, I, I was orange-pilled in the midst of COVID, coronavirus, market crash, Zoom University, uh, studying economics, business, finance. And I said, screw it. And I, I dropped out and, and YOLO'd student loan money into Bitcoin and took on a manual labor job. <laughs> You still got the manual labor job? Nope. Uh, I was I was doing that until I uh, kind of found my way into a role with, with Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, part-time, went to full-time, and now doing that. So What an amazing decision you made, right? Yeah, definitely a leap of faith. Um, my my parents, uh, although they believed in me, were a little skeptical. but um, They yeah. get it now. Yeah, they get it now. Well, listen, fair play to you. That's, uh, that's a massive move. Um, you've absolutely crushed it since you've uh, been in you're one of my favorite followers now appreciate it i think you're smart as shit i think you had a lot of value and um, i'm really glad to to get to do this with you in person talk uh, a little bit more bitcoin with you but i do also want to talk about that you, you, this must give you some perspective on higher education now and we have this historic kind of uh, a roadmap that a lot of people have is that you go to school and then you go to well we call it school and then we call it university you call it high school and then School, college, school, college. Yeah, some people didn't. Some people not call college school. Uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, this is like traditional path. But now people are getting a shitload of debt. They get in a vocation when they can't get a job to pay it off. And there's a lot of people like you going fuck this. I don't need this shit. Yeah, I mean, like I think it's it's maybe a little unfair to say college is unnecessary for for everyone. Like there's obviously still like you know totally reasonable of course reasons to go. You know, engineering or you know, medical school or anything else. I mean, even like certain business or finance degrees, maybe. Um, but like just in, in terms of like the walled garden of, of secondary education and like just like the, the I guess, the access to information that, that is like, you know, that I've grown up in in terms of the internet and a quick Google search or like, you know, Twitter. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's unparalleled. And I think, you know, a lot of people haven't really understood that kind of change in, in environment, and, you know, what we're living through. I don't think everybody needs a, a degree these days to get a decent job. No, I mean, like you can, I mean, you're, you know, you're a proof of this. Like you can make money on the internet just with with hustle and, you know, I guess like being a dumbass, staying on the grind, <laughs> you know, yeah, staying on the grind. Yeah, we've grind, but you look, you're doing it, man. So listen, that's very cool. Uh, weird times, Dylan. Very weird times, and trying to interpret what's happening is super difficult. I know you spend a lot of time looking at uh, the macro environment. Uh, I'm trying my best to always understand it, and most of the time when I'm making shows, it's so I can understand how best to plan my finances. I'm significantly older than you, so I haven't got many years left where I, I can actually plan a retirement. And it's like, do I want my money in Bitcoin? Should I have some more in gold? Should I have some more in property? what's happening in the macro environment. Uh, so it's always good to get someone like you on to just talk about that and talk about what's going on. And you know, we're in very weird times. We have a cancelled country. We have uh, uh, we have treasury bills now being essentially, what, returning like, what, 2% or something with 7.9% inflation. So some people are buying those and giving away uh, 7% on the table, 8% on the table, 5% on the table. It's weird fucking times. What are you looking at? Yeah, I mean... Like I think, you know, first off is is that you know we have, I mean, I, I have, but I think we kind of agree that we have this thesis that Bitcoin is the best money the world's ever seen. 
um, and it's undergoing its monetization process um, that will be very volatile. But ultimately, the end game is that you know whether you believe Bitcoin is just a, a reserve asset or digital gold. I mean, I think we think that it'll eventually be a, a unit of account for for value in the world. And um, that's the kind of multi-year, multi-decade thesis. We're not there, obviously. Um, but yeah, totally, totally weird times. I think we're at the end of this long-term debt super cycle uh, where craziness, not only in like financial markets, but just the world in general is going to ramp up. Uh, the 2020s are going to be probably look back in history as like when a lot of crazy shit went down. Um, and so, I mean, starting with, with obviously with COVID, um, but Really, if we, you know, and we've talked about this, we had a show with uh, with Greg Foss and I, mm-hmm. um, we talked about kind of the everything bubble and Bitcoin's role in that. Um, and, you know, things have ramped up since then. I think that was last April. Uh, Bitcoin was, was cruising to all-time highs. Um, but now we see kind of broad-based consumer inflation. You know, when, when inflation's hidden in the asset prices, you know, they the policymakers, central bankers can get away with it. Now it's, it's hitting consumers' pockets. Uh, it's hitting energy markets, commodities. Uh, and people people are upset, rightfully so. Um, and so, you know, the Fed, um, and really, like, interestingly, the credit markets are in a really tough place uh, where they're starting to sell off, and you have rising yields in a historically over indebted economy. Uh, and I think that leads to uh, you know some pretty some pretty crazy places uh, if we continue on this path. Explain that credit markets thing. What actually is happening so people can understand? Yeah. So I mean, essentially, um, you know, everyone likes to look at equities or maybe Bitcoin, but really the kind of the driver of a lot of things under the surface is, is the fixed income markets. Um, so the, you know, the key thing to understand is that price uh, of, these, of these bonds or these you know, securities uh, are inverse to yields. So as people sell fixed income instruments, say because you're receiving a fixed 2% payment when inflation is at 8%, people sell these securities um, and what happens is um, the price falls and the yields go up. Um, so for say you know a, a treasury bond, people are selling treasuries, whether it's long dated or short dated, and because of that, um, you see these, these yields starting to rise. Um, same with like corporate debt or anything else, mortgage backed securities. Um, and so right now, because of this inflationary environment, because inflation was not transitory, like all of the policymakers and quote unquote experts said, uh, we see you know yields really like almost going vertical. Um, selling off in a, in a big, big way. And so, you know, the second order effects of that is that everybody with debt in, in this economy and in, in a credit-based fiat system, everybody is, you know, basically incentivized to be up to their eyeballs in debt. Uh, everybody is now facing increasingly so higher higher financing costs, higher, you know, basically a higher uh, cost to roll over all this debt, whether you're corporates, whether you're, you know, the U.S. government, everybody. Um, and so it'll be interesting because there's traditionally like there's somewhat of a, a breaking point uh, in terms of liquidity, in terms of kind of this d- slow, but I think gradually then suddenly deleveraging process um, that we're in where the Fed will be essentially forced to monetize a bunch of debt uh, and, and implement, implement yield curve control probably uh, into an inflationary spike or let the house of cards collapse. Uh, I think it's somewhat binary at this point. Okay, let's go through through both. Explain what yield curve control is. Yeah, so um, essentially, you know, the Fed's traditionally traditional buckets of monetary policy is interest rate monetary policy, um, moving the Fed's funds rate up and down. Um, they kind of exhausted that that weapon uh, back in the Great Financial Crisis when the rates hit zero. Um, so they turned to quantitative easing. So they just went bought securities, bought debt securities on the open market stuff. You know, stuff markets with cash. I mean, it's a little more complex than that, but that's essentially what happened. Um, did that for on and off for ten years. Um, tried to wean markets off of it, and <laughs> markets had a tantrum. We get to COVID. There's kind of this this unprecedented economic slowdown that's a result of of you know forced lockdowns, um, and a result of that is governments, households, corporates, um, because of how much you know funny money they threw at this coronavirus problem. Now we have debt at, at all time highs, you know, across the economic, uh, across the economy, across the economic sectors, um, and so you know because because they exhausted their first bucket, their first tool, which is that that interest rate policy, and they really uh, over the last over the last decade, but over the last two years especially, exhausted their kind of quantitative easing, which is a fixed amount of purchases at any price. Uh, they're trying to, and I think over the next day or two, they're going to. I guess officially end that program at the same time that credit markets are really selling off. And so yield curve control is in theory an unlimited amount of purchases at any price to keep bonds at a certain price level. Um, saying that we're going to be a buyer at, you know, 
any price of this of this security, whether it's treasuries or mortgage back or corporates. Um, and I think you know that's ultimately probably the the end game. And you see central banks like Japan already doing this. The difference is Japan or other central banks that have implemented this aren't the world reserve currency, and you know <laughs> they're just not the size of the U.S. credit markets. They're not the risk free kind of rate in the world. And we're seeing that dynamic change. But I think ultimately that's when 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 Bitcoin probably bids to infinity is if and and when we get to that point. We also have, as you mentioned, the part, the chance that the house of cards will collapse. I'm not sure if somebody allows that to happen. I, I, my assumption is, is there would be avoidance, but I don't know what a collapse would feel like or look like. It, I could argue we're in the early days of a collapse. Uh, I've, I've done the basic research of reading when money dies, and you feel like we're living through the first chapters of that book. Yeah, so I mean, essentially, I mean, we've seen plenty of, of debt bubbles, and no doubt we are in a debt bubble um, throughout history. Um, and, and how those debt bub- bubbles are resolved is um, depending on kind of the, the circumstances. Right now, where we have a fully fiat based system. So, say in the Great Depression, when there was a huge private debt bubble, um, all that credit contracted, it burst, that malinvestment was liquidated, but ultimately there was kind of that gold collateral that it kind of collapsed back onto. And so, you know, there was bank runs and, and all the like. But uh, those fiat promises, those IOUs, could collapse back onto a hard monetary asset. Now there's nothing backing the currency it's except credit itself. And so the, the solution for the last 40 years to any debt bubble burst was more stimulus, lower rates, uh, kinds of you know, Keynesian economic uh, response. But now we're at a point where the Fed's fund rate at zero. Uh, inflation is at 40, soon to be 50 year highs. Uh, and everyone's up to their eyeballs in debt, uh, approximately 400% debt to GDP. Federal government debt to GDP is over 100%. Um, so there's no, basically, there's no way um, that they can, <laughs> that, that we can get out of this or that they can kind of let it collapse. Uh, but what a collapse would look like is that essentially when, when commercial banks or money is created, it's through credit expansion, it's through lending. When a bank, a commercial bank lends money, it actually creates money. But when a default happens or a repayment, uh, that money's destroyed. So the reason why these kind of like, you know, the great financial crisis or COVID or potentially what is coming in 2022, uh, it happens so fast and the, the volatility explodes is because, and these kind of the leverage cascades is because money is destroyed. And so the asset liability mismatch, um, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're less credit worthy because the asset, asset you thought you had isn't actually there. So you, you have to sell additional assets to cover your liabilities and it, and it just compounds across the entire economy. And so uh, ultimately that leads to literally everything going to zero and and like a societal kind of, it sounds re- very dark, but it leads to a, 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 just a complete economic collapse. Um, and ultimately it's not politically feasible, uh, which is why the response will be eventually uh, more printing, more stimulus, more monetary expansion. Uh, how far they, they let it get, uh, you know, we'll see. But could that not lead to a different kind of collapse, or do you think that is a way of uh, pushing the burden onto other people, onto pensions, onto uh, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, really, when you're talking about a, a fiat currency, and, and if you look at say, like you know, government debt, um, you can look at like private sector debt or corporate debt or, or anything else. But with with government debt, um, with a with a fiat currency, history has shown, um, and just kind of political incentives show that they, they that creditors or that. You know, debtors, governments won't nominally default, meaning they won't just say, oh, you're not going to get paid because they have a printing press. Um, and the Fed is supposedly independent, but not really. Nominally paid and yeah, so you, and you'll purchase be purchasing power paid are very different yeah, things. Yeah, you'll be you'll be paid out. Whatever that, you know, those, you know, that funny money dollar buys you is is an entirely different discussion. Whew. Um, maybe you should get paid out on Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think that's that's the end game here, um, and you know if you can hold through volatility, then um, Bitcoin is is probably going to outperform every asset on the planet. So you're you're fully you're fully convinced of this now. Yeah, I mean, people ask me all the time just because, like, I'm I'm you know my job is is a market analyst. I uh, I do daily research uh, for Bitcoin magazines like Premium Product. I um, I like advice for a hedge fund, and that's like a, a Bitcoin fund. Um, so they ask, you know, what are your inter intermediate term, short term market predictions? And like the reality is like it's entirely dependent on this macroeconomic outlook, on liquidity, and like you know to say with certainty what's going to happen is a fool's errand. It's but over the long term, um, you we can kind of look at this really, you know, th- these binary paths. But really, it's not binary. It's like 
only there's only one option, and it's additional credit expansion, additional monetary expansion, um, and 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 kind of know where this is going. But even in the kind of other scenario where we see a deflationary collapse, like you don't want to hold money in the bank, you don't want to hold bonds, you don't want to hold, you don't want you want to hold something like, and this is kind of going to the Ray Dalio framework. Why do you hold gold in a, in a debt crisis? Well, you hold something with a production cost. You hold something that is not someone else's liability. You hold something that you can secure yourself. And so um, ultimately, and, and you know, it's very hard to produce. Like you can think of that as like a stock to flow ratio. Well, the good news is Bitcoin is all of those things and it's actually way better than gold. So um, in, in either kind of case at the end of a debt crisis, uh, I ultimately, I think Bitcoin is, is that asset you need to own. Yeah, I mean, that's the thesis, a lot of Bitcoin to support, but the thesis hasn't fully played out yet. Um, you could argue that a lot of people don't consider that when some people argue that Bitcoin is risk off. So if we see a crash, some people think that Bitcoin might crash. Uh, part of my own portfolio management as a consideration is that I'm like irresponsibly long Bitcoin, right? I'm 95% Bitcoin. But I was thinking, should I just like t take 10, 15%, put it into gold, just hedge that Bitcoin a little bit, just in case Bitcoin isn't the hedge that people think it is. It is still gold. It's still governments buying gold outside of El Salvador. Russia's stocked up on gold. China's stocked up on gold. I have been going, I've done this a few times, Dylan. I've been going through that consideration. Uh, when I interviewed Cullen Roche, he was like, it was Cullen 25, 25, 25, 25, or was he third, third, third? I think he was third, third, third. E equities, scarce assets. And fixed income. Yeah. He was like, whatever happens, you always got a bucket of the right thing. So you should be fine. That's like an even's way to play. I mean, I think you can just like change the dials a little bit. But I was just, I'm not, I'm I'm 100% convinced on the long-term thesis of Bitcoin. I'm not 100% convinced it plays out in the short term. Yeah, and that's totally fair. I think, I mean, honestly, if, if you're looking for more of an asymmetric hedge, um, I would say, and and this is kind of, a paradox because you see inflation at, you know, 50 or 40 or highs, but honestly cash and, and Lynn Alden phrases is great. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, phrase it exactly how she does, but like cash is, is basically, uh, it's a speculation uh, over the short term, but long term it's, you know, it's basically a liability. Um, so during these kind of deleveraging events, whether it's March of 2020 or 08 or even 2000 or any time there's a recession, if you, if you can hold cash, it's going to appreciate against real assets. And that's what we've seen. I mean, Bitcoin is obviously volatile. It has its own market cycle. But really, since November, every asset's gotten killed. Most assets. So you think holding cash is good? Yeah. I mean, like I, I, hold, I hold a cash position. Um, and I, and I've, I've been building one, as lo along with my, my Bitcoin stack. But ultimately, like, you, you don't want to hold cash over the long term. Over the short term, um, there is an asymmetry there. Because during a credit unwind, which I believe we are in, um, you know, you could see a rapid appreciation of your purchasing power. Like long term, you're, it's politically a guarantee that your your cash is going to erode. And Just explain that again. So, why, why during a, an unwind does uh, your purchasing power increase? Um, because ultimately, you know, people become for sellers uh, of of their assets. Okay. Uh, and and basically, that's that's a result of of the credit system unwinding. And so, um, risk premium kind of unwinds um, people. Like financing, like broad market liquidity in general dries up, and so um, cash in that scenario. Although you know, because everybody levers up during the credit expansion cycle, everybody's is going risk on. But during a risk off period, um, cash, <laughs> I guess, cash is is king. Cash although, is king. although although the long term game is that cash is is trash. ultimately trash. And so you know, I think we're in a weird spot in this in this economic system. This you know Keynesian like end game, if you want to think of it. Where you know people are forced to kind of play hot potato and guess, um, but ultimately, I mean, having a stack of cash isn't a, a bad idea. But uh, over short to intermediate term, but I think long term, uh, if you're just simply you know DCAing Bitcoin with some of your disposable income, um, as well as having you know maybe an emergency fund in, in U.S. dollars, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold you know emerging market currency cash. I would definitely definitely just because of how this global monetary system is set up, uh, everybody in the world is implicitly short dollars. Right, like there's so much dollar-denominated debt out there um, that essentially what what's happening is that during a broad-based market sell-off, there's a bid for dollars, and everybody's short dollars. Like think of a short squeeze. That's what's happening, but with the fiat currency. Um, but ultimately, you know, the Fed politicians come in and they they quell that short squeeze by by debasing, right? 
um, but we're not there. What tends to happen to property in one of these scenarios? Yeah, I mean, so I think in in I real because I'm just buying a house. Yeah, in real purchasing power terms, um, you know, I think it's it's obviously location dependent, um, and I think also uh, Brandon Quidham has a has a pretty great uh, thesis on like kind of the fourth turning, and so you know, property, I guess, depending on location, can be a risky bet because you don't know. Uh, I guess like the the kind of the political environment or jurisdiction or or tax laws or or how that's going to change. Um, so there's there's risk there. Um, but just in terms of you know, uh, I guess fleeing from from the debasement of of cash over the long term, especially if you can get a really attractive fixed rate, I wouldn't take on variable rate real estate at this point. I've taken on a, a very attractive fixed rate. For yeah, five year actually. So yeah, I mean that's that's totally uh, totally a good call, but. Uh, anything with with variable rate, especially in a in an environment where rates are rising pretty rapidly because of this CBI inflation, um, you know, can get can get pretty ugly for those that aren't prepared. Well, one of the big questions at the moment is whether the U.S. government or the Fed is about to lose the dollar as a global reserve currency and as a as a global store of value. Uh, and the question I'm asking is not if it is. I mean, it clearly is. Uh, we had Lynn Alden recently. We talked about this multipolar reserve currency world. Uh, Bitcoin is a growing reserve currency for a certain group of people. It's, it's still small, but I think for everyone in this room, it's probably a reserve currency. We know gold is certainly a reserve currency for, for people and growing again at the moment. We know there may be other currencies that people consider holding instead of the dollar. The question I really have is that, is there actually a benefit for the US no longer being a global reserve currency? What what is the impact of that? Like, have you looked into the impact of it? Not like, what were the benefits of being the res- reserve currency, and what would be the benefits of not being? Yeah, so I mean, essentially, the 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 big drawback of, of you know, and then this was predicted back in like I believe the '60s with the, the Trifon dilemma. Uh, Might have been earlier than that, um, but this economist Robert Trifon was essentially like any reserve currency, um, if basically meaning that you have to supply the world with your currency, in this case, dollars, um, you're going to hollow out your industrial base. Which happened. As a result, and it, it happened exactly as, as he predicted. Um, so it's a form of Dutch disease. Essentially, um, if you become so good at exporting, um, you know, whether it's a certain industry, in this case, our industry is <laughs> exporting our treasuries around the world, um, then, then your other industries become less competitive relatively. Um, you know. And so, I guess... That's exactly what has happened. Uh, our industrial base is completely left. We now re- rely on China and Taiwan and um, all these countries for stuff that we really, really need. Um, and so, you know, the the dollar as reserve currency has been very good for our financial industry. It's been it's been very good for kind of the coastal elites, uh, software, tech, um, tech, yeah, things with with you know, kind of with with high margins. Um, but kind of that industrial base um, that that America was actually kind of known for. Um, it's completely hollowed out, and so you know, over the over the short term, uh, it that kind of reshoring all that manufacturing, it'll be it'll be probably painful in the sense that uh, the U.S. and like kind of you know the consumerism of the of the United States, uh, it'll it you know it, it's going to be more pricey. To- is is there an argument that there's a need for this though? In that one of the things that the outputs of COVID is that people have become less location dependent for their jobs. Uh, we know there's now distributed companies that have happened because of COVID. People shut down their offices and not reopened them. And then suddenly realize that people can work anywhere in the world. I mean, we're a, Danny's in one time zone, I'm in one time zone, Jeremy's in another time zone, Ben's in, like our entire entire team crosses the planet, we're in different time zones and it just works. A lot of people have figured that out. And in figuring that out, it's like, well, I don't have to have a office in uh, uh, the West Coast of America with engineers costing three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, I can actually recruit engineers around the world at a lower rate. Is there any argument that the the the, the software and the financial uh, the roles in the financial industry have been affected by this, and therefore there is a need now to start bringing back manufacturing? And is, I'm, I'm trying to imagine: are there scenarios where people want this to happen? Because it it almost feels like, especially what Jerome Powell said about moving to a multi-reserve currency world, is there an incentive to do this? Yeah, I think in terms of political incentives, it's tough because the the incentive structure for, for I guess, even like 
really all global politics, but uh, if you're thinking about the United States and, and election cycles, it's very short term. Um, the incentives aren't very aligned to to plan for these long term kind of things. Um, so, so it's tough. I mean, Powell's comments on the reserve currency and the potentially being multiple reserve currencies was was very telling. Um, with all that said, I think the U.S. dollar is still, um, despite you know talks with with China and Saudi Arabia coming out today about you know oil trade for yuan stuff like that. That's very like that's the long term significance of that is is real. What what came out today? Uh, it was I, I didn't even read it in full, but it was Wall Street Journal article about Saudi Arabia and, and China talking about uh, energy deals in Yuan. Wow! Um, and so China exports or imports about eighty five percent of their energy. Um, so just in terms of you know being a China is obviously they have you know they export things all over the world, but they don't have their they don't have energy markets, yeah, so and so. Uh, so people listening, uh, we've just got up on the screen. Saudi Arabia is in active talks with Beijing to price some of its oil assets to China and yuan. People familiar with the matter said a move would dent the U.S. dollar's dominance as a global petroleum market. Mark another shift by the world's top crude exporter towards Asia. Interesting. Yeah, and so I mean, essentially, the reason that the, like the U.S. financial markets have been just so globally dominant, whether you're looking at um, like treasuries are also just like equity performance since the great financial crisis. It's uh, anybody with uh, a current account surplus that, that with energy exports or really anything um, that it's selling them to the U.S., well, they, they get dollars in return. And then what do they do with those dollars? Well, for the longest time, it was just pummel that cash back into treasuries to get a yield. Uh, well, now with kind of that real yield with inflation at 50 <coughs> highs, you know, there's there's no incentive or, or less of an incentive to buy treasuries that are basically eroding your purchasing power. So what do they do? They pummel the cash into equities, <laughs> into U.S. equities. And that was, a, that was a really big driver of the last two years of equity performance. Um, and so the U.S. kind of has this artificially like engorged financial system as a result of this, of this petrodollar dynamic. Right, okay. And how much, do we know what the inflation rates are in China with the, with the yuan? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I do know the data is very. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's too dependable. Uh, actually, I'm well out of my depth, but I, I would wonder: is this uh, China essentially making an offer to Saudi Arabia, saying like we want it priced in yuan because they want to grow the strength of the yuan? They want, you know, with the Belt and Road Initiative, they want to have other countries using yuan as a global reserve currency, or whether this is Saudi Arabia who are nervous about. What's happening with the dollar? I, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know. But I guess China would face this issue that it is a manufacturing base. But if they want to become a global reserve currency, they're going to also suffer from the Triffin dilemma. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely no geopolitical expert, but um, just kind of off surface level, I, I think China as a reserve currency is challenging because to be a reserve currency, you have to open up your capital markets um, and and open capital flows. Um, and I, I don't think that's something that the CCP wants. Um, so it's really interesting because there is no, you know, there's there's talks of maybe it's the yuan or maybe it's the euro, but there really isn't a viable like second option. And for the longest time, uh, post great financial crisis, there was chatter among central banks, the IMF, the World Bank saying, we got to do something about this dollar, right? Like, um, there's something is broken, and now they're you know they're doing massive quantitative easing programs. What what's the viable alternative? And there was none. Um, and and the reality is that the, they haven't really figured it out. Um, and Bitcoin at whatever it is, eight hundred billion dollar market cap, isn't globally liquid enough or even close to big enough to to filling that role. But increasingly, individuals like you and me, uh, institutions, corporations are saying. No, this is our reserve currency, uh, and we're moving first. But you know, the the big boys haven't figured it out or haven't moved yet. When would Bitcoin be big enough? Does it need to be ten trillion? Does it need to be fifty trillion? Is there even a number you can put it at? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say you know, multi trillion dollar market cap. Um, it starts to get serious um, in terms of being kind of a, a viable viable asset class. For, you know, to take over. Like, I think ultimately. It takes, you know, oil energy is priced in in Bitcoin terms, long term. Um, how how long that takes is is up for discussion, um, and it's ultimately just a total guess. But yeah, I think around five to ten trillion dollars, and and ultimately it's it's going to be probably an order of magnitude larger than that. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I find it super fascinating. I've, I've been back into Bitcoin seriously for five years, but I would say I've been consciously on a Bitcoin standard for about two years now. Both the podcast and personally, um, and 
when I say I'm in a Bitcoin stand, it doesn't mean I hold all my assets in Bitcoin. I am holding cash as well, like you, more so on the business side, uh, less so personally, but I am holding cash. But I am making decisions based on understanding Bitcoin. So I mentioned I bought a house. And my, to my broker, I was very clear, I want the longest mortgage possible with the lowest deposit, with the, uh, uh, with the longest possible low interest rate. So I think I've got a five-year around 1.99% on a 25-year mortgage. So I've got a five-year fix where I have to renegotiate. And I think the deposit's like, I can tell you, I'm just trying to figure out, it's about 15%. That's, a, that's the best I could get on that. Now, I could have paid a higher deposit and a lower interest rate or changed the top, but that was the best one. Because in my head, I'm like, if you're giving me a five-year 1.99% interest rate, you're essentially giving me money. Yeah. And and that's that's how I started to think. So I'm on that standard. I'm prepared for it. And what's really super interesting is I know Danny's on it. I know you're kind of on it. And I know all my friends in Bitcoin are kind of on that. Uh, but it's us in Bitcoin. And it's Michael Saylor. And it's a little bit of Tesla. But I feel like with everything that's happened this year, we've just, you, you just met Adam Curry. We, we were talking about with him. Danny's going to give me a really weird look. So just don't mention that interview. With them. We're going to release them at different times. Sorry, everyone. Um, but where was I going with that, Danny? It, Bitcoin being part of every story. Oh, yeah. Bitcoin being part of every fucking major story that happens right now. It doesn't matter what the story is. It's now this Bitcoin angle. Our podcast downloads are going insane. We're like, I feel like we're, we're about to go through that next growth curve where we've gone past the nerds and the financially interested, we're just now getting into people who are like, I don't know why, but I know I need this shit. Yeah, it's going to be part of the, the geopolitical discussion. Um, and whether that's public or not, um, it, it's happening. Um, talked with Jason Lowry and he said, you know, he's talking with FBI, CIA, all the, and he said this on Twitter space, I'm not like disclosing private information, uh, Department of Defense, um, and, and they're not laughing at him. I mean, so, so like people are paying attention. Bitcoin is definitely part of the debate. It's obviously, you know, the the market's taken a hit since you know the November all time highs or whatever it is, but the volatility is nothing but a thing. Um, and, and ultimately, um, I think the the interest in the capital in Bitcoin, uh, especially since since like you know the market's been been kind of getting hit in 2022. I think there's there's some some interesting bidders under the surface that maybe they're public, maybe they're not. Um, but they're understanding this end game. You know, when we if we see some sort of deleveraging event, if we see some broad based liquidity crisis in in the traditional financial markets, well, Bitcoin is still going to be probably around an order of magnitude larger than it was during the last huge crisis two years ago. So it's like, okay, what's and what's the response going to be if we see any any sort of kind of crash happen, right? And then people are going to say Bitcoin's not a store of value; it's dead. It's not an inflation edge, yada yada. But it's still 5x, 10x, you know, higher than it was at the bottom of, of March of 2020. Dude, we're at 39,000. What are we saying, Shift? 39,000. Two years ago, it was at 3,800 at, at the bottom. But yeah. And so it's like, okay, have, let's have some perspective here. And what's the response? Are they going to stop expanding the money supply? Well, this is what people need to get their head around. And it comes back to time preference and patience and building up with your DCA because you say, oh, two years ago, it was 3,800. When I, Bought my first Bitcoin when I got back in, and uh, I can't remember if it was end of sixteen, start of seventeen. It was around that like December, January time. It was about eight hundred bucks. I bought a Bitcoin for, and I remember it going to two thousand, being like fucking wild. And then it went to twenty, came back down. Like we know the end game for this. Like this could drop back down, but yeah. we still know it's going higher. Yeah, and you just got to be able to play that long game and be patient. DCA in. In four years' time, do you think it's higher or lower than that? <laughs> Probably an order of magnitude higher. Exactly. The block clock might not have enough space. Uh, can it, uh, can it, it can't do six figures, can it? It can. It can, uh, it can adjust with, it can say like million or whatever. You can put it in like different currencies and it can, it can say that. So NV, can, NVK's got it figured out. Has he? Yeah. I think he's just going to have to release a new one. <laughs> just get longer and longer. What was, uh, what was the first price you came in at? Ish. Uh, uh, my when I turned eighteen, it was the, it was basically the end of the three k bottom. So I got so I got some stacks in there. You were in your first tour of duty, your first four years. Yep, still haven't. I actually, I'm about to. Yeah, I still haven't completed it actually. So I, I always think for you first, you you do a four year tour of duty. We're in our second one, aren't we, Dylan? Yep. 
Yeah. Um, okay. That, I mean, that's all kind of fascinating. What What are you monitoring with regards to like commodities as well? Uh, there's a show we want to make at one point discussing essentially commodity wars. So we had Lynn Alden I mentioned on the show. Uh, we had a, actually we had on a few months, a couple of months ago. We did a show called Currency Wars, talking about the future of currency wars, and then bang, a fucking war kicks off, and we're essentially in a currency war, and we're in a you know people are using the financial system as a weapon of war alongside you know, bombs and and uh, propaganda. We've now got a financial financial war, and then we got it back on the other day uh, to discuss like the reality of what's happening. But it feels like we're going into like commodity wars now. It's like, well, who controls what energy production where and what are the implications of that? How much of that are you tracking? A good amount. I mean, first off, how great is Lynn Alden? She I mean, is the fucking best. Yeah, it's unreal. I mean, she was, she was, and I should have paid more attention. She was a, a loud commodities bull. Uh, and, you know, obviously, like, who could have predicted a war, but... Do you get a newsletter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, you know, a premium subscriber, no doubt. $199 yeah, a year. It's ridiculously cheap. So, I just interrupt. So, I um, I put that as a tweet a couple of years ago because people are like, fucking ragging on me for the show. And I was like, listen, there's three types of podcasts. There's a smart person, a smart person, a moron, and a smart person, and two morons. I said, my show is a moron and a smart person. I'm cool with that. But with Lynn Alden, that's our biggest spread. <laughs> yeah, Lynn is, Lynn is fantastic. I mean... Um, she's been documenting it out. One, I listened to uh, Peter Zihan. He's um, an expert, kind of global macroeconomist. Um, definitely not going to say I'm I'm some commodities expert, but I definitely follow it just to understand kind of the implications of, of what's happening. Um, and part of the reason that you know, I guess, notably like bearish on the legacy system and warning of somewhat of a liquidity crunch, deleveraging is just looking at previous recession periods um, and what's happened. Leading up to that, with with energy prices, commodities, um, there's a real big impact on on kind of the consumer balance sheet, on corporate margins, on just on just a slowdown in the economy in general. Last time we saw an energy you know energy prices rip like this was leading up to the Great Financial Crisis, and obviously there was kind of a contagion in, in subprime. Um, but all of this kind of commodity shortage, right? Like the whole Russia Ukraine thing, um, the implications of that are massive. Russia produces. Off the top of my head, I think 15% of the world's natural gas, um, like 40% of that goes to Europe. I mean, what's the prices at the pump in where you are, where Dude, you live? Nuts. Hold my fucking beer. Uh, people here like putting photographs up of five dollars, six dollars a, a, a gallon, and I'm like, okay, let's do the maths. How many liters per gallon? We're paying this. It's like ten. Oh, ten dollars. Yeah. Well, it's actually more now. Yeah. It's over ten dollars. I mean, <clears throat> when I left, my car's usually. Uh, about 80 pounds to fill up. When I left, it was the first time I ever went over 100. It was actually, I remember the number, it was 100 pounds and 13 pence. I was like, fucking hell, I'm over like 100 pounds. And now when I get back, it's going to be like 120 pounds. Yeah. It's fucking insane. And yeah. look, I don't mean to be a dick about this. Like, okay, I can afford to do it, but, and, and I'm not doing this as a flex or to look down on people, but I know there are people where this materially affects them, where they're going to have to make a decision. It's like, shit, I, can I afford to fill my car up? Do I now have to get a bus to work? Like this real, and we had we were speaking to Nick Carter. And Nick Carter said humans flourish when commodity prices are low. Yep, for obvious reasons. Yeah, and so I mean, part of this, the the crazy thing is, and and why the you know policymakers are so trapped is we're seeing broad based inflation, but it's not really a result of monetary policy. I mean, I guess you could backtrack it and say it's a result of mul like multiple decades of monetary policy. But right now, the inflation is because. You know, we have a commodity shortage, commodities across the board, energy, um, and now like the knockoff effects of, say, like natural gas, uh, Russia's natural gas supply being cut off. Well, <laughs> that happens to produce uh, fertilizer. And so now we're seeing, we're going to see essentially food shortages all over the world um, in, the, in the third, fourth quarter. Like, not meant to be dark, but this is just the reality that we're facing. And so, it's basic supply and demand, what happens? Prices go up. People, there's going to be there's going to be not enough food. There's going to be not enough energy. People are going to have to cut back. And so um, a recession is, is not even really a result of like the, the financial conditions. It's a result of a shortage of real goods. And so when that happens, what's policymakers? Like with COVID, say everybody got locked down. There was a, a, a demand shock or really a lack of demand, right? So they could throw a bunch of money at people. Uh, oil went negative because there was like, all the reserves were full, right? So they threw a bunch of money at people. It was relatively fine. You know, you could you could buy your services, you could buy your goods. There was inflation, but you know, there was such a, a lack of demand that we could make up for it. 
Well, there, the supply chains kind of got shattered because of that. Uh, and now economy is kind of heating up, going back into full swing. We throw this war in the mix, uh, along with just the trillions of dollars that were printed. And now there's a huge shortage of all the stuff that we need. And throw that, just throw like you know Putin. I think whether it's strategic or not, uh, there's there's huge implications of the West just boycotting all of Russia's exports. They they produce so many precious metals. They produce natural gas, energy, uh, and so really we're looking at kind of a bleak outlook over the coming you know six to twelve months. Maybe maybe further, um, and maybe like a, a lot of Russia's oil supply. I think it's like ten million barrels a day. They supply the world. If that if that production goes offline, it's not like a Bitcoin miner where you can flip it back on. It's gone, and so it's not it's not gone for the next year. It's gone for decade decades. Um, and so there's there's some pretty big stuff happening behind the scenes. Um, and so like again, I'm I'm no commodities expert. I'm not I'm not in this every day, but I've been watching the, the charts, and it's like my God, there's something's breaking. You get, you see volatility across commodities, equities, credit markets, foreign exchange. It's you know, I think it's going to intensify. There's, uh, there's no, there's no, you know, happy ending here over the over the short term. Are you prepping? Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, oh. I mean, a little bit. I mean, I, I'd say like definitely going to stuff my my freezer with with some meat. I mean, I think it's maybe even a little late for that, but uh, definitely, definitely financially prepping, uh, getting my Bitcoin stack and saving some cash, as well as you know, uh, I think. On the food side, maybe energy as well. It's not a bad idea. It's a real wild time for you to come like into this as a, a career and job. You've gone straight into the fire. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's exciting. I, I definitely um, just kind of taking a step back. I think we're living through some historic time. So from that sense, from that perspective, it's it's fascinating. Um, I think I'm going to look back and say, wow, you know, I was really thrown into the fire there. Um, but we're all living through it. It's historic times. So. Yeah. So, what what do you think happens if uh, commodities and and fuel just keeps going up? Price controls. Well, price controls. Uh, history tells us that's the worst idea that 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 can happen because ultimately it leads to massive shortages and it, it disincentivizes production um, because you know if you're not profitable, um, you know it's the the price is going up not because of like Elizabeth Warren says of greedy corporations, but because. There's just not enough supply to meet demand. Um, so price shortages, I mean, it happened in the Great Depression. It leads to famine. It leads to catastrophes. Um, so central planning, price controls, horrible idea. I uh, hope policymakers don't do it. But I bet they do. Probably do, which is, which is going to be tragic. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. Yeah. I mean, France have announced that they're going to rebate petrol. They've done put like a two billion dollar, a two billion euro deal in to rebate people's petrol prices. How do they do that? How do they execute it? I, I don't know. Have a look it up because yeah. uh, we've also seen in massive increase in energy prices. I talked about it. Um, uh, one of the things of moving house, I had to go and like uh, transition my um, uh, energy suppliers, so I have to do a closeout, and and I hadn't checked my. I'm supplied by uh, Shell, I think, for gas and electric, and I hadn't checked. And I'd gone in there, and it's got you got the monthly price, and it ranges, you know, from summer months like maybe sixty to eighty pounds to winter months maybe one hundred twenty pounds. Uh, the most current month when I went in was three hundred and fifty ish pounds. I was like, what the fuck? It's because energy prices has gone up, gas has gone up. Like, we heat the house with gas, we cook with gas, right? Which was like a massively like scary moment to go through to, to see that happen. And then, and now we found out that, uh, no, well, it was announced that in uh, Scotland, they're providing grants to people or grants or subsidies to, to support the, the massive increase in energy prices. And by the way, when I was looking at those prices, that was pre Ukraine, yeah. Russia. What, what you found it, Danny? So <clears throat> introducing a rebate, 15 cents, cents in euros, uh, per litre yeah. of transport, Fuel. 15, uh, 15 cents to $16 per litre of transport fuel to help drivers cope with soaring pump prices. Prime Minister Jean Casset, I don't know how to pronounce that, said in an interview with daily newspaper Le Parisien, the measure to apply for four months from April the 1st, April Fool's Day. Huh. Do you have April Fool's Day here? Yeah. Yeah. Expected to cost the government just over 2 billion euros, he said. Retail, gasoline and diesel prices soared to record highs in many countries across the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. That last sentence is interesting. The measure, which he said, 
No, sorry. Macron has said his government has already spent 20 billion euros a year to moderate gas and power costs. Jesus, fuck. I mean, I wonder what that is because, if, I mean, 15 cents, uh, I mean, if you're at two euros a litre, I mean, that doesn't take it back to like when it was like 150-ish. It's, it's only a small. I wonder if the incentive there is like the f the fear that people can't go to work. Is it like to keep keep the wheels I mean, of the economy a, it's turning? It's to quell social unrest ultimately. I mean, I think that's kind of what we're going to see in the 2020s, um, and we see this at the end of these kind of debt cycles. Fourth turnings is that you know the 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 plebs kind of revolt, and 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 oftentimes it, it gets ugly. And so uh, the political incentives align to you know to I guess quell this unrest any way that's possible. Um, I think one of the things we didn't even mention is that a lot of countries around the world, exporters of these commodities, are becoming kind of protectionist uh, with their exports. You're seeing, um, you know, South American countries saying we're not going to export our soybeans or our wheat or our, you know, we're going to make sure we're we're good first. Um, and so there's probably a decent chance that the U.S. does that with their energy. And so what are the implications of that in the global economy if that happens? It's an if, not not a when. But um, all of this kind of protectionism leads to even higher prices, um, which is where things kind of get really crazy. Well, that's where Lynn brought it up as well. She was saying one of the issues, though, with that is that like, do you have the refineries that yeah. can refine the oil that you're uh, you're mining in your country that you're extracting from your country? That is that is an issue. I wonder if we're going to go through a phase of essentially deglobalization. I mean, globalization has its obvious benefits in that you know certain, certain countries are better at producing certain things than other countries, but. It's also shown how COVID showed how fragile this. What happens to supply chains? We had in COVID, we had shortages on the shelves. We had a massive run on when we were away. We had a massive run on the petrol pumps. the The pumps ran dry. People could not fill their tanks because people got scared. I wonder if there's I, now I've this got is a story same. about that. And I was in London when that happened. Okay, queued for about two and a half hours with my sister to get petrol. Wow. Got to the pump and I only had my phone to pay on, and it only had a credit card. Holy shit. <laughs> what did you do? I had to leave. Oh, that's bollocks. After like a two and a half hour wait for petrol. Yeah. Oh, were you angry? Oh, so angry. My sister cried. Uh, I, I've experienced one in the UK and at that, that, that time I, I refused to join the kind of freak out and I said, accepted I'm not going to drive my car and I just didn't. I stayed at home and refused to be part of it. But like it is a reality of that situation. Uh, you've talked about potential food shortages I know what what will happen. People won't be prepping now. There'll be a few people. But when it really hits, it will hit hard and the shelves will be empty. And then what they'll do, they'll introduce the equivalent of a price control in a supermarket, which is a, a bulk order control. Yeah. You can only buy one or two packs of pasta, yada, yada. But that stuff's coming. Can you look up the Scotland thing, the rebates on the, mm -hmm. the gas energy? Because I'm sure that's a thing. It's like, definitely a thing I've seen. That. But where does that money come from? Do they print money to do that, and therefore does it exacerbate the problem? I mean, any anything that's financed by the government ultimately is. I mean, there's obviously a tax base, but ultimately, if they're deficit spending, which most governments are at this point, um, then yeah, it's. I mean, it's printed, but it's funded by the printing press. I mean, with the, with the ECB, the you know the eurozone, it's like technically not the sovereign, but you know this you know eurozone governing body, but it's, it's still the same. I mean, they're monetizing debt, balance sheets expanding. And they're 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 running deficits. I've never actually fully understood how it works in Europe on a single currency because if you have sovereign currency, it's kind of obvious you can just print more of your own currency. I don't fully understand how it happens in Europe when you're when there's a single currency across it. Yeah, I mean there was almost the eurozone almost blew up in the in the two thousands uh, the two thousand tens with the kind of the the debt crisis that happened uh, and ultimately it just ended up basically saying all right we're just gonna we're just gonna buy your debt and we're gonna push down these yields and uh, you're not gonna go insolvent but definitely definitely like uh, not as not as smooth of a process as say just the Fed working in tandem with, with Congress but you know more or less TLDR they're printing more. Um, and and also deglobalization, like if we're just saying maybe 2020, 2021, 2022, Putin's move last month, if, if that's the peak of this you know secular trend of globalization, that's not that's not uh, deflationary. That's not uh, disinflationary. You know the trend that we've seen. That's very very inflationary because you lose the economics. The um, you lose eco yeah. economies of scale, so therefore things get more expensive. Yeah, you lose the process. Yeah, and so for a historically over indebted economy, uh, you know, doesn't end well. Um, it ends with again like a, a collapse in credit, 
uh, and a deflationary bust, but ultimately we know that's politically not feasible. So it ends with money printer go burr again. Did you find anything? On Scotland, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Energy bills rebate. Yeah, so here we go. Energy bills rebate. That's actually Richie Sunak. Okay. As the UK grapples with a severe energy crisis, it's becoming increasingly rare for consumers to hear anything. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, yeah, some positive news did come from the UK's Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, earlier this month when he said the government plans to rebate some of the cost of rising energy prices to consumers. The vast majority of households expect to receive up to £350 to help due to a combination of council tax discount and repairable energy bill discounts. Yeah, so that, look, that's happening in the UK now. Like, they're, they're preparing for this. And it, it does get cold in winter. And the energy prices are fucking high at the moment. It's going to get ugly. Yeah, I, I also, I try and hope and like try and be an optimist that things won't get too bad, but I, I get to sit down with a lot of people. I get to sit down with you, with Lynn, Mark Moss, Alex Gladstein, and it's it's not good news at the moment. Uh, and I, like part of me is like, right, I need to go home and I need to prep, I need to you know, fill up the freezer, I need to fill up the, sh yeah. but then I want to be like, I don't want to be that guy. Is it really going to be that bad? Like, are we about to go through... It's different from you. You're half my age and Greg Foss is like eight times older than you. <laughs> but are we about to go through like that worst moment of our lives? Is this going to be something where like my kids have kids? I'm going to say, oh, remember that basically in the 2020s it was bullshit. I don't know. I hope not. I mean, I'm a, like, I don't fully know what's coming either. Um, I guess, and and I would say, like you know, while we have been a little bit uh, maybe gloomy or dark <laughs> on this episode, I, optimism. I am I am an optimist at heart. Yeah. Um, that's and that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin, um, as I think it gives it gives me a way to, or really everybody, a way to kind of secure their future and not be dependent on on anyone else, um, and kind of you know have that that sovereign that sovereign wealth that sovereign choice can we all though can, can is it a lifeboat for everyone if 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 if, if everyone flees to bitcoin at once would suddenly the price shoot up and therefore like some people sell off and then they trap some people like i i i always have to be honest about this because like a slow increase in adoption of bitcoin is good for price and good for everyone but there are people who bought bitcoin at $69,000 it's now at $39,000 they've halved themselves they've got to either wait it out and if they can't wait it, and if they sell a bit of their Bitcoin, they've lost money. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm fully behind the broad move to a Bitcoin standard. I think everyone should understand Bitcoin and move to it. But if there is a rush to Bitcoin, like every time there's a blow off the top, and then it's like, how long do we take? I mean, we've essentially been flat for a year. So anyone back in, I don't know, when did we go to 69? A few months ago, yeah, September was it? We don't know when they're going to be back in green, and they may yeah. be. And, and yeah, be patient, be way, hodl. Yeah, some people cannot afford to hodl. Yeah, that's a totally fair point. Um, you know, it's I guess from that sense, it's not like you know, buy Bitcoin and you're completely insulated from all this stuff. It's just not true. Um, but I think over kind of, and, and you just said like you know the the long term mindset, yada yada. Um, but you know, I think ultimately, uh, Bitcoin offers over the medium to long term, um, kind of just a way to insulate yourself from all of this. And so, yeah, to have Bitcoin, you need to have a surplus. You need to, to be able to produce more than you consume. Um, and for a lot of people, unfortunately, like, that's just not the reality. Um, but for anyone that, that is, or you know, whether you're living in a Western country or you know, a dictatorship, um, even, even with the volatility, right? Like think about people with the Russian ruble. There's 150 million people that because of some you know, belligerent dictator are completely cut off from the rest of the world financially and had their currency collapse by 50%. Um, and so like from that sense, like, yeah, Bitcoin is, is volatile, um, but what's the kind of weighted DCA price over the last six months or a year? I mean, it's, it's not 69,000. It's, it's, it's probably above 38, right? Um, but you know, you, how many times have you had your net worth dropped in half over the last five years, right? <laughs> like I've, I've, since been, I've been in Bitcoin, I've seen my net worth draw down 50%, three or four times. Dude, I've, I've had my net worth go from rich to poor twice in the last decade. I've lost everything, pretty much. Uh, now, it's not going to happen a third time because I've protected myself, but I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it at 50%. I, like, but once you've done your first tour of duty, that that cutting in 50% usually happens after a 5x or a 10x. Yeah. If you haven't had that first tour of duty, it's and tough. you've had, yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. And I'm, I'm always conscious that we, we, sh we have to advise people in the right way with this. Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, like obviously, like the, for the volatility, it's like all right, don't ape a hundred percent of your 
savings, if you have savings at all, into this. If you can't afford to to watch it cut in half potentially, or or you know, if if it doesn't go parabolic next week. Um, but I think you know when we're talking about these end game scenarios, I think you know ultimately uh, with kind of the craziness of the world, I think. It could lead, you know, these, I, I said this earlier today, I was talking with Pomp. I think if you're looking at kind of like this Who? The, uh, with on Pomp's show. Who's Pomp? Uh, <laughs> Who's that um, guy? He has uh, the second best podcast in Bitcoin. Uh, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't look down. <laughs> um, but I, I think these, these kind of tail distributions of like the f- like fiat end games of, you know, right side or left side or whatever of deflationary depression, collapse, hyperinflation. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, this is just kind of my thoughts, but I think those tail distributions aren't as improbable as most would like to believe. Okay. Um, and, and ultimately, it probably ends up with a, a currency collapse. Um, and I think the U.S., str- the dollar is the strongest currency, but all the other fiats will collapse. The dollar will probably be the, the last on the hill. But ultimately, it collapsed. And so, you know, if you're, like, it is, I guess, somewhat irresponsible to say, you know, Buy Bitcoin with everything you have. Lever up. Like I mean, I've said it. Like I, I told. Like I, I'm transparent. Like I, I was taking student loans money in March 2020 and buying the dip. Like is that irresponsible? Probably, but did, I did. Did it. it work out? Yeah, I worked there out. There you go. I mean, so, <laughs> but like, don't do that with with something you can afford to lose. I was a reckless 18 year old kid sitting in my dorm room, right? But ultimately, I think this end game is you know you're going to want to be insulated at all costs. And if you have any any wealth, even in Dollars or bonds or even probably equities. I mean, they'll maybe maintain some purchasing power in nominal terms, but in real terms, you probably get crushed. Well, what's the deal with like your friends? And I, I don't mean this in any way condescending. Uh, I just want to understand like a different age cohort because my friends' age cohort is 40, 40 to 45. I don't want to say 50, 40 to 45. And we're in a position where we're at the tail end of careers, certainly considering the world, I'd like to retire by 60, 55 would be ideal. You know, hopefully towards the end of a mortgage, we're, we're at that stage in life where we need to be preparing. And, you know, I have conversations about Bitcoin and they have to consider it alongside things like pensions and paying off yeah. their mortgage and stuff. At, at your stage in life, it, it's not as, you, you're more like start a career, yeah. but thinking about maybe want to get a home. Like, I don't mean it in any kind of constant way at all, but like, what is the cohort of your friends? Are they, are they, are they naturally understanding of things like Bitcoin? Are they intrigued? Do they come to you and say, I think I need to think about it? Like, what's the deal? Yeah, I mean, so I would say, like, I was definitely the annoying Bitcoin guy for a while. Um, so, luck, like, like, I'm happy to say, like, a lot of people close to me, friends, um, have been stacking, did stack, um, have have a nice, you know, and, like, that's that's their savings account. And I told them that. I was like, dude, this is your... Yeah, it goes up and down, but this is your turbocharged savings account for your future self. Just just acquire some and sit on your hands. Um, so I guess like from that mindset, yeah, like a lot of us, I'm I'm in a you know lucky position to to have an income um, and you know not be saddled with debt and in school. Um, but you know not everyone's in that position. Um, you know mostly like kind of like low low wage jobs. But yeah, I mean I still say like hey, just ten bucks a week, put it away. This is for your future self. And so I think my kind of bubble. Uh, is definitely more orange pilled than the average, uh, you know, zoomer. Um, but I think in general, um, there's kind of a sense, unfortunately, of like kind of a nihilistic approach yeah. uh, of just like you know, I'm gonna ape GME calls. They're like, you know, I'm gonna throw everything YOLO, like NFT in, bullshit. Yeah, like NFTs. You know, I mean, there's people that made a lot of money with NFTs. Congratulations. Like honestly, I, I'm I'm happy for those people. But there's Buy also some Bitcoin. Yeah, there's also a lot of people that lost everything in scam coins or you know JPEGs or you know YOLOing in in the options market without even understanding what an equity derivative is. And so I think that financial kind of nihilism almost is is a result of kind of just being like trapped out of the current system. It's like you know the boomers have rode forty years of the the longest the the longest asset bubble ever, um, and and you know we're saddled with six figures of debt. Like what do I have to lose, right? And so. From that sense, I, I think you know Bitcoin offers some hope, but uh, it's it's important to keep that long picture in mind. Fair play, man. Uh, last last thing I want to ask you about uh, on chain, I'm not as convinced as I was of how useful it is. Um, I think when too many people think something's going to happen and use it on chain, that gives information to other people to counter trade. Is it still useful? Is its use changing? Like, where are we at with on chain? 
I definitely think it's useful. I think <laughs> during during the bull market, everyone's a genius, uh, and during during a bear market, I mean, uh, like like Willie Wood has hung it up. I'm not sure if that was because of performance or just because he's been in the game for a while. Um, but I mean, it, it is inherently useful. I think from the sense that you can see transparently, like people people you know will put together models, and and I've done my fair share of saying you know, I think number goes up, <laughs> um, and I've been right and I've been wrong, um, but. Just ultimately being able to see, like, hey, sixty-one percent of the supply hasn't moved in the last year, or I think it's like sixty-two percent. That's a tick away from being its all-time high ever. Um, Eighty-seven percent hasn't moved in the last three months. Something like that, where you can quantify. And I and I've been saying this like publicly on Twitter. I think the marginal selling has been because of the macro backdrop. You know, hedge funds, whatever guys that are correlation trading with the S and P five hundred, they've been marginal sellers. But who's? I mean, the the marginal buyers have been. The plebs, the DCA army, etc., and like the ulti- ultimately every Bitcoin parabolic bull cycle that's seemingly random isn't all that random, and it's a result of under the surface you kind of see this like wave of accumulation happen, this wave of of basically a supply squeeze, and then all of a sudden just a, a little wall of money hits the, the the market and price goes parabolic. I mean that's that's why we were at nine k all summer. What was happening under the surface? There was just a massive accumulation occurring all all through basically after the 2017 bubble. It was just a three year accumulation that that basically concluded in 2020 and well, price went parabolic. This is the conversation we had the other day. That kind of like between eight and twelve phase we had for ages. It feels like we're there now, but it's a, like a bigger range. But it's like 36 to 42, yeah. 45. It feels like that's a new range we're in. And I mean, even if you want to look at it like. You know, from 30 to 60k is like this year range. What's happening on the surface is a massive accumulation. And so, you know, regardless of what happens over the next six to 12 months in the legacy markets, you know, things go to the hell. Hopefully not. Um, but under the surface, there's a bunch of people with a ton of conviction that are hoarding this absolutely scarce monetary asset. If and when the the hot ball of money hits Bitcoin again, and it will, of course, prices. It, like people aren't really ready for what's what, what comes, and so that's that's why I say like you know, it's good to, to get some Bitcoin even even if price could go to thirty k, price could go to twenty eight k or twenty five k, and it's not the end of the world. But ultimately, when when that when those money flows snap back, it's it's going to run probably harder than than most people can comprehend. Be and, ready, and then and then you know the the analysts or the you know legacy people will say it's speculation, it's random, it's totally volatile. Why, why is this happening? But the cool thing is, like with on chain, we can say like, "Hey, there's a really, really tight free float supply. You know, it's maybe a couple million coins. And we can see that and say, mm-hmm. you know, if anyone comes in significantly and tries to scoop this up, price is going to run hard. Um, and so I think that's why on chain is pretty useful. Fair play. Well, listen, Dylan, um, it's great to see you grow your profile in Bitcoin. Uh, I think you bring an amazing depth of knowledge. Uh, fully deserve success. Um, it's just amazing to watch, and I congratulate you, and I thank you for coming in and doing this. Uh, if people want to follow you, check out what you do. Where do they go? Yeah, you can just follow me on Twitter uh, at Dylan LeClaire underscore. Um, I work with Bitcoin Magazine uh, doing some stuff uh, with a deep dive. We get a rebrand coming soon, but uh, you can just find that uh, in my profile link. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate you you flying me out and, and doing this. This is this is an awesome show, and congratulations on your success. I mean, what episode is this for you? Where are we at? 476, 477? 476, the next one. Five, 500 coming soon. Coming soon, yeah. Uh, I want Jack Dorsey. <laughs> I'd be completely honest. I think that would be a great show for 500. Uh, if we don't get that, we have a choice of just get one person, get a few people on. Uh, I said, actually, if if we don't get Jack, which we probably won't because it's hard to get, uh, I actually want to do it with Pomp. Uh, he's my boy. I love him to pieces. Uh, I, let me tell you something really cool about Pomp. Um some people would think we're competitors because we do the same kind of thing, right? Uh, if I phone up Pomp and I say, I need your help with something, he'll text me back within 24 hours and say, what do you need? I'm on it. And if I meet up with him, whenever we sit down, we get to do it once or twice a year, we both go, this is what I've learned. This works, this doesn't work, I'm doing this. And we share everything. We, we help each other as best uh, to be as, success, as successful as possible. So he, for me, would be a great episode 500 with just to look back on the last few years and talks of shit to each other. I'll tell you a funny story as well. The first show we ever made together, uh, it was about three hours or two and a half hours. We agreed to cut it in half, but we had this rule that we said, uh, every time you say Bitcoin, you get a $10 fine. So we tried to make a whole show. He ended up like, I don't know, seven, five to him. I owed him 20 bucks, but uh, I love the guy. So maybe I'll do it with him. But look, appreciate you, dude. Keep crushing it. Anything we can ever do for you, you just let us know. And are we out tonight?
I'm sorry. Are tomorrow we out? night. Is it tomorrow night? We're out. We're out tomorrow night. So we'll get to hang out again. A group of us talk Bitcoin and uh, have a drink. You can have a Coke. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Dylan. <laughs>